Yeah, I was ready. Start. Right here. You need to go right here. That's the safe thing. All right. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,771 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Now, we've got two very specific rules that we follow at the college, one of which is uh, no uh, one fool at a time, and the second one is no personal attacks. Now, we follow a specific format. We listen to a presentation followed by question and answers, and these should be questions. The third part is uh, rebar remarks and rebuttals. A uh, certain few minutes for everybody gets to speak. And the last part is the speaker's final remarks. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our 10 upcoming programs. Please note, we've made a few adjustments during the week to the schedule to accommodate speakers, so your printed schedules may not be accurate. Also, we may fill some of the spots that are open right now during the week, so check again to see about the finalized schedule. Okay, now, on June 22nd, uh, we're going to have a retired academic uh, from Purdue, I believe, uh, talking about how the climate crisis can be attributed to capitalism. We've got to get rid of capitalism, he says, in order to save the earth, and I agree. On June the 29th, this is a new entry. Our own Mike Lee will be talking about his trip to Europe, and he's going to talk all about high-speed uh, sustainable transportation by rail. So there could be a good program. And they're, they're well advanced, the ICE system in Germany. On July the 6th, we're going to try something brand new for the college. We're going to have a point counterpoint. I'm going to talk about 25 mistakes that have our country has made. I'm not going to talk about some of the major ones, but I'm going to offer solutions as well. In the tradition of the college, you offer a problem and a solution. And my solutions are really good. <laughs> we be followed by Peter Pirro, long-term college regular, who thinks there's America's mate is wonderful. He says, God bless America. And he wants to talk about all the wonderful things the United States has done. On July the 13th, this is presently open. Although uh, it may be filled during the week, we've got a number of speakers, uh, adjustments to the schedule. So the number that were under discussion. But if you'd like to speak, please let me know. I need a, a, a title and a brief description of your presentation. And please, no repeat programs. On July the 20th, uh, the gentleman here who feels we're going to talk talking about green energy. And he's got some his analysis. He does not think that green energy is going to work. It's going to meet our, our, our energy needs. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the climate crisis again. On July 22nd, a gentleman wrote a book. This is economics. And he's calling for a new social contract. Interesting program. He comes from our satellite campus. On August the 3rd, Tom O'Donnell will be returning, young man, and he's going to give us some uh, advice on how to improve your mind, something much needed at the college, how to improve your mind. Hopefully everybody should attend this program. On August the 10th, we're in an election year. We're going to have our first ever political candidates, Mark, Mike Rice, running a vigorous campaign in the 8th District outside around Chicago, uh, and he's got some views. Uh, he's saying to get him elected uh, the, for that district. This will be followed 
on August the 17th by Chad Copy, who had been thinking about running for president. He's, he's a farmer. So we're going to hear about rural issues and farm issues and food issues uh, and the agriculture, the place of the agriculture industry in our nation, food processing and so forth. So that's Chad Copy, candidate for the seventh district. Uh, okay, now uh, on August the 24th, we're going to welcome H O M E home which is a really, really good organization everybody should learn about. It's it, This originally started as the Little Brothers for the Poor, but they're one of a kind organization that works for senior citizens. They take them shopping, thousands of rides apparently, and they're looking to, to provide them with independent living, uh, which is a common theme among seniors. They wanna remain in their homes. So August the 24th, uh, H-O-M-E. That leaves August 31st is open uh, if you'd like to speak. And transitioning into September, we have three dates open, 7, 21, and 28. And on the 14th, we're going to have a, this is another interesting candidate, uh, Ashley Ramos. Running right here in the district in the sector district against Kelly, Robin Kelly. So this is a hot contest. Uh, she's running a vigorous campaign in the second district centered in Chicago. Anyhow, that's it. Thank you and take it away, Tim. Okay. Uh, all right. We're now going to welcome our uh, speaker tonight. Um. Sid Cohen, he's going to kind of speak during his speech. Um, let's everybody give a, he's at 96 years old. Sid is probably one of the biggest, best uh, guys who well represents age and, uh, and well, and has kept his mind well and sharp. All right, Sid, I'm going to give you a microphone yeah. and uh, we'll uh, get you started here. Hand in the microphone behind the thing, please. All right, let's welcome Sid Cohen. Yeah, yeah. For president. Okay. All right. Okay. There you go. Good. Go ahead, sir. Um, it's, it's all right. It's all going. When um, Karl Marx went to the what they call the gymnasium, which is actually a university, he wrote home to his father that he's learning ancient Greece because he wants to learn about their philosophies and about the way they lived and the, the makeup of that. So his favorite um, um, philosophers, one was named Democritus. The other one was named Heraclitus and the next one was made Epicurious. And he read those three. And as far as democracies were concerned, everything in the universe was made up of atoms. And the atoms, besides atoms, there was void. There was nothing there. So he read this and um, democracies also said atoms are indestructible. You cannot destroy them. But as we found out, under the University of Chicago, atoms could be split. And that's where the atomic bomb comes from. But to make that type of uh, idea during that period is, is very comprehensive, very intelligent. And then there was another philosopher his name was Epicurus, and he wrote about democracy. And, um, and he said democracy was wrong in one way, that the gods um, uh, m made up their mind what we should do, and they were guiding us. But he said that the gods were slipping 
we're living in different entities and nothing to do with uh, ruling us or controlling us. They lived in separate entities and they allowed humans to do what they wanted to do. You might say he was the first deist, like Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were deists. Heraclitus made the comment that you could not step in the same water twice because the water is contrary, constantly moving. So you cannot step in the same water twice. There's always change and there's always contradictions. When two people would argue about things, they use the dialectical formula and that is to try to see where that person was making contradictory remarks and to catch them on these dire, uh, the, the, uh, the false remarks that's where you find the truth. It's more or less like detectives in Chicago or any other big city. When they capture somebody that committed a crime, they, can't, they keep um, having them go over and over and over again what he actually do, uh, done, and they look for contradictions in what the person said. And that's the way you find out the truth. Well, the same thing as far as, as the countries are concerned. Like the United States calls itself a democracy. But yet, when we first came into being, the only ones that could vote were white men with property. Blacks couldn't vote, Indians couldn't vote, and women couldn't vote. So. Another thing, if you look at Central America or, or all of Latin America, we find that the United States has always supported dictatorships in Latin America. If you're talking about Papa Doc Duvalier in Haiti or Batista in Cuba or, uh, or uh, Pinochet in Chile and all these other countries, like for instance, in Argentina. Argentina had a revolution to a certain degree, and when it captured the people that tried to carry it out, you know what they done? They took them up in airplanes, thousands of feet high, and they dropped them into the, into the ocean, and they killed them. Then they took their kids and gave the kids to rich people to bring them up. So there's so many contradictions when we talk about democracy. Another thing, three people in the United States own half the wealth of the United States. So that's another contradiction. And the best definition of democracy is what? Like I said, it was Lincoln of, by, and for the people. And we never had of, by, and for the people in the United States, and no country on earth has had it yet. Probably the closest one to it is Cuba. Because before any election, they go around the country and they have them write down and discuss what needs to be done. Of course, Cuba is a very poor country, doesn't have the wealth, and there's a blockade against it from the United States, so it can't get the, the necessary materials to feed their people right. But they had them go around and say what they needed. So what they needed, if they had the, the the wherewithal to provide it, they would give it to them. That's what democracy is supposed to be about. Not a few people owning half the wealth of a country. Another thing, 
there's what they call a unity of opposites. A unity of opposites is, for instance, capitalists and workers is a unity of opposites because they have opposite needs. The capitalists want to make more profit and the workers want to have a better living standard and make a better wage. So it's always contradictions there. Another thing, a unity of opposites, if you take a car and you go on the road, you have a unity of opposites because you have people driving the car and you have roads that they go on. And there's, these are two opposite things. If we talk about airplanes, there's a unity of opposites. We got the air and we got the plane, two opposite things. But with the, uh, with the, with the gasoline and the propellants and the way it propels the airplane, we overcome that. So it's an opposite, but at the same time, it's a unity because you have to have air in which to fly in. There's a lot of unity of opposites. And you could think of it by yourself. We're eating now and we're eating on the table. That's a unity of opposites. Or just lifting the fork to put it in your mouth is a unity of opposites. There's unity of opposites in everything. That's one of the basic laws of matter. <laughs> Another one is a uh, negation of the negation. What that means is essentially feudalism was negated by capitalism. But it wasn't just negated. It also rose to a higher level than feudalism. Because with capitalism, we were able to develop industry. And industry, we were able to make life better. Not only that, but we got machines. Instead of having people work on these big lands of the states, like they're done under feudalism, we got tractors. We got different things that will pick up the oranges or the, uh, or, or the uh, things that are growing there. So it's a higher form of development. Like for instance, during the revolution in France, we had feudalism. <laughs> and we had what they called the guilds. The guilds were small businesses that specialized in certain things. Like if you sure for your house, you go to the guilds and the guilds would make the furniture. If you needed a house, there was guilds that made homes. So you went to them and they made a home. If you wanted a, a, a picture of yourself or a picture of anything else, <coughs> there were guilds. And you go to the guilds and they will make it for you. Like, uh, for instance, Leonardo da Vinci belonged to the guilds. Michelangelo belonged to the guilds. So there were guilds for everything that you needed, clothes, food, everything. And that's the way people live under feudalism. Another thing about feudalism, the guilds couldn't get too big and there were certain things they couldn't do. They couldn't become part of the aristocrats. And there was all kinds of things 
for them not to do, or they couldn't do. Why? Because the feudal lords didn't want them to get too big and take over society. So <laughs> what essentially happened, the new world was discovered under Columbus. And when that happened, the Spanish, the English, and the Portuguese went to the New World. And the New World, they needed <laughs> homes, they needed furniture, they needed homes, they needed, homes, they needed, they needed, they needed So on the hill, started to become started bigger and bigger and bigger until the point where they out and out became factories. And when they got that big, what happened was they went into the feudal lord's property and they told the serfs, you have to come and work for us. And they dragged them away if they didn't want, or they would put them in stocks with their hands and their feet were in this wood and they couldn't do anything and kids would come up and throw things at them and things of that nature. So they had to come into the factories. The factories were miserable. They had to work from dusk to dawn. They had to bring their own coal so they could be warm. And they didn't get off even one day if they didn't bring a note from the from the uh, religious services that they went to, that they went there on Sunday, they couldn't get no time off. So they had to go to religious services. And they were even worse off than they were under feudalism. And in France, they had a bloody revolution. And when they got a hold of the feudal lords, they sent them to the guillotine. And at that time, they had uh, uh, like a, a, a government that had different parts to it. And one of the parts were the Jacobins. The Jacobins were on the left. And the conservatives were on the right. So that's how we got leftists and rightists. That's where it comes from. But in, but in, uh, in uh, England, there was a marriage between feudalism and, and capitalism. And the feudalists large became capitalists. That's why you still have a queen and a king and if we go to the Japanese, the same thing happened there. They had feudalism, and the feudal lords made up their mind that they better go and become capitalists. Other ones, otherwise the West would conquer them. So they became capitalists. So there was a wide difference between feudalism and capitalism. Under feudalism, they had none of these things. They had no cars, they had no airplanes, they had no, no, uh, nothing to uh, uh, grow things as far as tractors were concerned and things of that nature. So when I say negation, uh, in, in negation, it means the first negation, doing away with feudalism, comes to the fore and become, becomes the ruling class. And the new ruling class is far more advanced than the old. So we get progress. It's the same thing that's happening now. We're very much in danger of global warming. And you can see it very easily. If you go south and west, Last uh, summer, it was so hot in Phoenix 
that even if you were wearing shoes, you could not walk on the sidewalk. It was so hot. So if we keep going like this, this planet become a dead planet after a while because nobody, no animal, no human, no growth as far as food is concerned. So this will become a dead planet. Either we go forward or we die. That's the re resolution that is happening now. If you watch television and you watch the weather, they never mention global warming. Why? The government told them they cannot mention global warming. They're not allowed to. And if you watch television, you watch the news, just listen to it, and you can hear that every time you put on the weather. Is that it, sir? Yeah. Okay. I have to hold on to it because you have to answer oh, the question. Okay. 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 All right, we're gonna entertain questions now. Um, yeah. All right, who's got the first question? Okay, Ellen, you go you go first. Yeah, it's, it's kind of I thought it's interesting maybe to uh, Expand on your idea of growth or death. That um, I I heard that Lynn Horowitz said that the theory of the problem with genetic engineering and uh, the problem of the bio weapons and the vaccine is that it, they manufactured a gene that that regresses the RNA gene regresses versus growth. So it's interesting at the cell level. What do you think of that? Have you heard anything about that? Uh, I, don't, I don't know that much about it, really. Right. Yeah, so it's hard to answer. But what about like the Amazon? Do you think there's the ruling class or what the old guards are deliberately cutting down the forest? Well, yeah, what, what's happening in the Amazon, like uh, Japan, needs a lot of wood because it constructs a lot of houses out of wood. And they go to the Amazon in order to get the wood. Now, the Amazon, what happens is it sucks up a, a lot of um, the stuff that produces the global warming. I forget the name carbon of it. Dioxide. Huh? Carbon dioxide. Yeah, carbon dioxide. It sucks it up, and it's very good for the climate. So when they cut the trees down, you're, you're, what you're doing is making the, the planet warmer. And that's a big place at the Amazon. And it has a big influence on global warming. Okay, who's goes next? All right, Mike, hang on, hang on, Mike. Cloud, please. The best point you make is that government says, don't spread the news. Don't spread the news. Don't spread the news. Yeah. Thing. Use the yeah. Everybody exactly. Yeah. I think it's the bigs. Huh? The bigs. Like the big uh, corporations. Yeah. Those are the people, the big ones that they're advertising. Right, right. Are the big, the big. We can't hear the they questions. Are... The question Tim, repeat well, the question. Actually, well, actually, actually is the, okay, Mike. The government is actually a capitalist government, and it, it protects capitalists. For instance, when they want to take oil out of the country, what they do is they put the oil in the tanker, and they have ships from the United States protecting that oil. And they don't pay for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, hang on, let me get your microphone. Let me let me pass that to him for a second. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Well, I, I, I liked what, um, what's his name? Mr. Cohen. I, I, I like what you said about the contradiction. The, that, that's the way uh, detectives shop when they interrogate. Yeah. They look for contradictions, but you say it's, it'll, it'll, uh, you can get truth that way. Well, I, I'm in a sport. I'm still trying to get better at the sport, and uh, I could use that in, in the sport, the contradiction. And, and that'll give me the real truth, right? The better way of doing it. All right, we're going to let Sid go next here. Well, another thing I forgot to bring out, or I did to a certain degree, and that's change. Change, change is part of matter. And matter changes constantly. For instance, in your own, in your own body, you got cells that are breaking down and new ones coming into being. And, and there's a, what you call a, a, a tipping point where, where you're gonna die and that makes for, uh, for a change, a, 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 a real deep change. Okay, who's next? Okay, let's uh, hang on, hang on, let me get your microphone. So I'm going to ask the question that I think Tim O'Donnell would ask if you were still here. Um, Tim okay. left because he observed that you've been a Marxist for 80 years, and yet that hasn't solved society's problems. So do you think that is just the, the type of com the, that we haven't tried enough different types of communism? Do you think we need to try a certain part? Is there any reason you think communism has failed or yeah. do you think it has failed? Well, the Soviet Union was the most backward country in all of Europe. It was sort of like a chain that had a weak link and it broke at that link, uh, link. And so it was the most backward country in all of Europe. It didn't have the working class, let's say of Germany or of England or even some of the Scandinavian countries. It had sort of like a mix of feudalism and capitalism. So when um, when Lenin came to power, what happened was he wanted the workers themselves to run the country to a certain degree. By that, by learning how to work the country, eventually they wouldn't need a government. They would there wouldn't be a government. It would be a people that ran their own their own their own their own, their own society. The people themselves were the society. And they didn't need a government, and they didn't need a standing army because there wouldn't be no wars because everybody had their needs taken care of. For instance, in that type of society, you could teach people if they need something, to go to a certain store and pick out what they need and go home with us. But it wouldn't have no value outside of use value. You couldn't sell it. You couldn't buy it because there'd be no money. And people themselves were running their society. So it wouldn't be a need for all that. And you got to start that as soon as you come to power. Give the working class a certain amount of, of, uh, uh, of usefulness as far as running that society. When Stalin come to power, he didn't do that. Everything was done by the party and very, very little was governed by the working class. And that's why it failed. Another thing, they couldn't provide the things that were needed by people because of the Cold War. They put so much of their money into war material to match the United States 
that the living standards started to go down. If they would have put their living standards first and the Fed second, they would have been okay. And that's what's happening in China. They put their living living standards first. And they try to raise the living standard of the average worker. China used to be almost 90% poor people. Now, more than half of the population, as I think it's 1.4 billion people, have been brought out of poverty. Okay. Uh, I'll get then, and then I'll give you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you talk about the government making it illegal to talk about global warming. I didn't that's, say that. All they do is talk about global warming. That's all that comes out of bite me's mouth. Bite me. So the question. So the question is. Like, what they say about the weather? They never say global warming. Never. Yes, they do. They almost say it's daylight. No. Uh, yes. Where? 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 All right, well, Charlie, you got your hand up. Go ahead, Charlie. Charlie, go yes, ahead. Sid, uh, yes, Sid. Uh, and, and, uh, it seems to me that the, the communists were always going around the world trying to take over countries. And they claimed it was what? liberated to liberate them. As a matter of fact, even the, the leader of communism in 1960s, he said, we will bury you. They were trying to take over the United States. Do you think that would have been a good idea? Yeah, What's your question? Do <laughs> you think you the, we should let the communists take over the country? What? <laughs> I don't know what you're asking. Please, no. please, Do you yes. think communism, communists should take over the United States? The people themselves would run it after a while. Here, here. Right now, you have people, if you run for office, you got to have millions of dollars. You got to be on the phone constantly getting the money. And who gives you the money? The millionaires and the billionaires. And they're the ones. The call the They're not representing me or you. They represent the, the ruling class, which are the rulers of the United States, which are the billionaires and the millionaires. They don't represent us. We have to go to work and get our money once a week. They have enough money to make them live 30 lifetimes, 40 lifetimes. Okay, we got a question over here. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Would you define dialectic materialism? Sure. Dialectics is two people facing each other uh, okay. and they're trying to find the contradictions in the other, other person's philosophy or, or uh, argument. Material means it's not what you say, it's what you do. What they call practice. Praxis. It's what you do that counts, not what you say. Most philosophers, it's not praxis, it's what you're thinking. That's what they talk about, which means nothing. Okay. All right. Who's next? Who's next? Uh, who's next? All right. I uh, said I'd like to ask you a question myself. Seeing as uh, that's okay, I can. Seeing as how the world has benefited under capitalism 
and its growth for the last 300 years, what makes you think seriously that communism is going to work? Because every time it's been tried, it's led to poverty. It's led, like under, like I said, even under Stalin, you had 60 million people killed. You had an authoritarian dictatorship. Um, and in the United States, you had material prosperity and forward movement on stuff. How do you explain the contradictions then? Well, if you think thing, the United States was taken over by Europeans and they they said the only Indians that were good were dead Indians. And when they brought in slaves, you know how long slaves lasted? Seven years and they died. Women were not given the vote. It took until 1920 to get the franchise to vote. And, and they had that, like in China, everybody votes over a certain age. In Cuba, they go around to everybody and ask them what they think ought to be done in the country before they try to do something. And if they don't have the wherewithal to do it, they can't do it. But they do as best they can, given their circumstances, which is a boycott by the United States. If a country trades with the United States, they cannot go to Cuba. They go to Cuba, the United States will not trade with them. Okay, uh, Chris, you got the next question. Go ahead. Thanks, Tim. Uh, my question is, um, the United States is a constitutional federal republic and uh, supposedly a democracy. Do you still think that we still have a chance to keep our democracy? Well, we have Trump running, which is very dangerous. Everybody that knows what he's saying realizes if he gets in, you're going to have fascism. Like they had all through Latin America and Germany, Japan, and Italy. So somebody that votes for uh, Trump either doesn't know what he's doing or isn't, uh, uh, isn't well versed in what he wants to do. And they think he might do things better. But everybody knows he's a ethical lawyer, ethical logical lawyer, and the guy is so screwed up that anything he tries, he never succeeded. Okay, who's got the next question? All right. Uh, all right, let's, uh, I'll, I'll get, I'll get you next here. Give me a second. Let me get you the. Uh, I'll get. I'm going to get it for him. I'll get you next, Mike. Uh, well, are, are you are you a are you a, are you a Marxist, and why are you a Marxist? Well, it's capitalism really doesn't work. Most people in the world. You go to Latin America. That, those countries are so sit, poor. Sit, sit, sit. I, re I remember I was in Mexico. Sit, uh, mine, and we wanted to go. Start, again, start from the top, sir. Yeah, we wanted to go to Cuba. So we took a plane, and the plane got screwed up and landed in different part of Mexico. Madria, I forget the name of it. And there was a railroad car right next to the airport. And you see these old people, maybe they were 40 or maybe 50 at the most, and they looked about 100 almost. They were scrawny. They lived in the car boxes of the railroad. They, were, they weren't very well off. And if you go into the small, small towns in Mexico, the situation is very bad. There's an author, um, he wrote, um, uh, the um, uh, about the Sierra Madre, what the, the yeah Madre. yeah the treasure of Sierra Madre, and he lived in one of these small villages, and he wrote a lot about it, 
And you ought to see what he said about it. What he wanted, what happened was, it was a peasant. And he made these beautiful little, little baskets. And he seen these baskets and he said, oh, I could use those. I'll bring them to a store on Fifth Avenue. And they put their candy in it. So he had to make a few of them to show to these people on Fifth Avenue. They said, oh, get me them, get me them. So the, the peasant, that's the only thing he done for a living was make these baskets. So he ordered more. So the peasant told him, I cannot make more. I'm only one person. And what I do, I enjoy. I cannot do what you said. So here's two different value systems. One that's interested in only money. And the other one was interested in making his baskets and getting enjoyment out of it. Okay. Lee, I know you have a question in the chat. Do you want to give it or do you want me to uh, read it for you? Would you please unmute and ask uh, Send your question. What? Jian Lee has uh, put a question in chat. All right. This is from Jian Lee in our chat. Marx's dialect, Marx's dialectical materialism originated from the reaction to the Hegel's idealism. And Mark, I'm sorry, I gotta go here. Uh, I, I lost it. Yeah, he's right. Marx's Dialectical materialism originated from the reaction to the Hegel's idealism. What is the strength and weaknesses of Hegel's idealism and Marxist dialectical materialism? Well, Hegel, uh, Marx belonged to the young Hegelians when he was at the university. And he belonged to that. And he took those ideas and said, Hegel, was very intelligent, the most uh, intelligent idealist that ever lived. He calls Hegel, said all oh, ideal, uh, uh, um, dialectics comes from God. And God is the one that, uh, uh, that figured it out. Now, Marx also read uh, Feuerbach, who was a materialist, and he took these two ideas and put them together to show you what the basic laws of matter are. And that's what he done. He put them both together and showed you the basic laws of matter and how to change it. Well, it's how, do you, how do you use it to change society? Okay, now, in, uh, in, I have an addendum to that question. Uh, in 1776, Adam Smith wrote the book called The Wealth of Nations, explaining how money and the pricing mechanism help distribute goods. He also mentioned uh, things like mass production, and he also, and a lot of times now, that's the basis that's been used for a modern capitalist society. Yeah. Who was right, Marx or, um, or Adam Smith? Adam Smith was right first time. That was a progressive thing over feudalism. But things change constantly. Things never stay the same. Like I said about the human body, cells break down, new ones come and take their place. So you can't do away with change. And you got to have change for each different period. Uh, he was right about that period, but he's not right now. But, I, but, but when you look at it and you go to an economist, like um, say, for example, a guy out of Sweden, um, he has talked about the consistency of the model of capitalism where they have uh, uh, capital raised, innovation occurs when they get a bunch of people together, like in a corporation or through government research, or even now the open source doctrine, which is the basis of what the internet is. I'm not saying it's all capitalism because there's a lot of government research in there. And third, there is such a thing as the development of Linux. 
can you please comment? Because I see I see capitalism more flowing than it's ever had in my whole life, and it's still working. Um, what happens is when you take basic materials like copper, zinc, any material that's on the earth, eventually we're going to use them up. There's no constantly breaking down these things and using them constantly. We're at a point we won't have enough to get by. So we got to ration it in order to get by. And if you don't ration it, you'll run out of it. Now, there's a, there's a philosopher. Well, I don't know if he's a philosopher. But what he said was, eventually, we're going to go to other planets, and we're, we're going to be able to mine other planets. But that had, that's maybe 200 years from now. So we got to say what natural materials there is and use it wisely so we don't use it up. OK, Charlie, you got your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, supposedly. They say it's free market capitalism. But then the government comes along the other day, I see, and they're ordering employers, factory owners, to a certain pay employees and fast food to pay a certain wage. What? Do you think, uh, are you in favor of requirements being placed upon companies? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, you gotta you gotta control them because I was listening to a program today where people had uh, uh, the blood disease. Uh, what? what the heck? Yeah, diabetes, and they said the price of the the medicine is so damn high, a lot of people can't afford it. The the uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry has become so greedy that it's that people have to die in order to get the medicine. Okay. Um, I think you're intentionally that way. They, they know they're being controlled. Okay, no, no, we've got they don't care. So all they care about is the bottom line. Okay, we got a question from Lily over here. Lily, if you can stand and ask. Okay, Lily. I, I just want to ask, um, what do you think, um, how do you think the Cuban people are doing today? And do you think we'll ever end the embargo? How are the Cuban people doing and will we ever end the embargo? Uh, like I said, the Cubans are having a very hard time because they don't have the workers in order to do the work. So you have volunteers that are that are doing overtime work, but the kids can't get milk because of the embargo. And it's only a small country, maybe 11 million people there, and they've they've um, um, done a lot of good things. There's people with certain eye diseases where they have the only cure for the eye disease. There was one boy that had to go there. This was years ago, and the eye disease was cured. And they have people that want that, but the United States won't let them um, give it to them. Otherwise, they'll fall off trade with them. Okay, Chris Cruz, you're next from online. Go ahead, Chris. Well, we'll get him. Okay, Chris, go ahead. One second. Unmute, Chris. Gotcha. All right, Lily, hang on. Chris. Hold on, Lily. Do you think the up. embargo will ever end? Do you think the embargo will ever end? Okay. If enough pressure is put on them, maybe it'll end. And most countries in the United Nations voted against the embargo. There's only about Five countries that voted for it. Okay, so uh, Chris, you're next on the line. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Uh, my question is, um, what is the difference in your mind uh, between Marxism and autocracy or dictatorship? What's the, what's the, what's the difference? Chris, why don't you say it again? Yes. What is the what is the difference between Marxism versus autocracy or dictatorship? Democracy. Autocracy. 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 It's not really. But in um, in um, Russia, it was to a certain degree uh, the dictatorship of the party instead of the dictatorship of the workers, mm -hmm. and. They didn't have enough power in Russia. They should have stopped trying to build all these defense weapons and let the people have the money to buy things. They made big mistakes in Russia. And China is learning from those mistakes. It's not doing that. Is the United States making, that, making a, a difference in that? Oh, yeah. United States has the embargo. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you. Who's next? Anybody else here up next? Yeah, All right, Mike. All right, Mike Lee, we'll get you next. Then you're all in favor of um, Marxism over capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Here's my, here's my theory is that we have to have um, democracy and free market. However, it has to be uber regulated. Because whenever you hear about Republicans or authoritarians, they're like, get rid of regulations, get rid of regulations. And it's all about their, you know, we're the big, we want nothing, you know, no government control. But we have to have... What's the question? Okay, the question is, why are you not in favor of free, the free market we have to have regulations, a free market with lots of regulations. America is so corrupt. Actually, there is no more free market. Then we went out with the golden cord. Free markets, that's about 100 years ago that it left. What you have now is monopolies. And monopolies control almost the whole economic system and they got so much money to buy off the politicians that the politicians a lot of them won't uh, vote for things that make the people happier and the democratic party acts like the party of the people but he gets the same money that the republicans get but he gets but the Republicans get more of it. Okay. Who's next? <laughs> oh, we still got plenty of time. Unless you want to start rebuttals right away. Um, who else has got a question? I'll ask one. Um, do you think it's a good idea to try to achieve a moneyless society? Yeah, well, eventually that's under uh, true communism. People would work and just go in and take what they need. If they were out of a pair of pants, oh, well, then you go and get a pair of pants. So it won't cost nothing. Uh, people will, will be satisfied because you, if you try to sell it, it won't be worth anything. It, it will have no money value because there won't be any money. You just go in and take it but you contribute to society. That's what makes you have it. He's talking about use value versus exchange value. Question from Luke. Go ahead, Luke. Uh, uh, excellent, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have an example of a modern country that uh, a communist country that you would uh, showcase? Well, I would say Cuba because they go around and they ask the people what they should do and what needs to be done. 
And the government um, tries to do it if they have the wherewithal to do it. And I would say uh, people, no, there's no millionaires and there's no billionaires there. And if people need something, if there's an extra supply, it's 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 just given to them free. Very good. All right, Charlie, you're next. Go ahead. Charlie, yeah, Sid, go do ahead. you think, Sid, do you think the government should take over industries and nationalize them and operate industry for the people and not for profit? Let's say the railroads. Do you think the yeah. government should take over? the railroad network of the United yeah. States and operate it to deliver goods for people instead that's of for that's what they done. That's what they've done in England and called it uh, socialism. But in England, they compensated the railroads. They really, they really didn't uh, uh, do what they said they were doing. Can you elaborate? Well, uh, like the coal mines in uh, in, uh, in in England, and the workers worked very hard in England, and the government took it over. I think um, I forget which government. Uh, I think the first one after the war. Uh, I forget his name, and uh, so they socialized it, but they paid off the. Uh, the coal mining industry. Okay, um, next question or uh, who else has a question? We're still kind of fishing for him now. All right, uh, did, did Ellen go ahead and uh, let's get the microphone to Ellen. Would you say the 30s, has there been a period in American history where, where we, um, you know, you, the communist thing worked. In the 30s, uh, during the Great Depression, the communists had about 100,000 members. And in Russia, there was only about 14,000 members. So Roosevelt became fearful that the communists can take over so he brought in the New Deal. But the New Deal was very limited. It was limited to the big cities and it was limited to a certain degree because the billionaires and the millionaires at that time, like Ford, tried to uh, get uh, Smedley Buckler to be a dictator in the United States. So he was fearful of going all the way with that. But if he did, we would have been a lot better off, but he was fearful of doing it because he thought fascism might take over. Okay, Sid, from the, from the chat, there's been some stuff uh, saying that each society is unique with its history and traditions. Like there's been some traditions in capitalism, some in communism, you know, some are cultural differences. What do you think the best way forward is that a country should adopt and what principles should it make to pursue its growth and help its people? To make what? To, what is the best way to make a country not only take care of its people, but promote its own growth? Well, what we have now, we're growing very slowly. Maybe a little faster now with Biden because he, he uh, put in some uh, uh, devices <laughs> as far as stopping global warming and the unions are getting stronger and most people in the union uh, are bringing in new people into the union so it's getting stronger and i think biden is okay except for war and they have two wars going one in ukraine and one in uh, israel and gaza and both of these wars are enriching the uh, the uh, armaments of the business, and the armaments business, of course, 
what it, what it does is in wars, things are destroyed constantly. If you have a car, a car will last maybe 10, 15 years. But in the war, it's destroyed in one day. So you have to keep making it. And that's what's keeping the economy going. Okay, Charlie, you've got another question? Yeah, Go ahead, Charlie. I, uh, a lot of people are complaining about recent increases in prices of food in grocery stores. It's hard for them to feed their families. Do you think the United States government should take over agribusiness and operate all farms to produce yeah. food for the people at cost? Yeah, well, they should, but they won't do it because there's only about three companies that control it. Um, I forget the name of the companies, but they're the ones that distribute all the food. And you have small farmers that are not making much, but they want to keep their farm. But you have industrial farms now where you have chickens in a little cage, maybe four or five, and they're pecking each other, and chickens are supposed to be out eating grass. And they feed them corn, which is not good for chickens. So that type of uh, farming is just awful. Uh, Tyson is one of the people that are growing chickens, and they have an indoor lot where they're inside a big barn and they go around in the barn and they have more room, but they're not getting grass to eat. When they get grass, that's what they're supposed to eat, but they give them corn, which they're not supposed to eat. Okay, we're gonna get a question over here. Lily, we'll get to you in a second. We're gonna, we're gonna, gonna go to Dan you. and then Lily and then Troy. <laughs> All right, a hundred, a hundred years ago in Germany, there were, there were street fights between the communists and the right wing Nazis. Do you, you know that, right, uh, Sydney? You know about the street fights in Germany between communists and Nazis? They were killing each other, actually, in the streets of Berlin. So do you think that America is close to 1930s Germany? Do you see fights between communists and, and fascists in America on the streets of Chicago and New York and LA? What happened in Germany, Hitler called himself a national socialist. So what happened, Goring, who had a big apartment in Berlin, invited all these people, the industrialists and the big uh, landowners and the bankers into his apartment. And they had asked Hitler, are you a socialist? <coughs> he says, no, but I have to use the word because that's what people want in Germany. So the communists got a lot of uh, people on the street fighting the Nazis. And uh, the Nazis would go around killing people with the brown shirts, Hitler's brown shirts. It was constantly going on before Hitler came to power. But when he said, that he's not a socialist, he's big industrialist. And, and the, uh, all of the uh, people that had the wealth supported Hitler because they realized if they did, there would be a revolution there. Okay. And the same thing could happen here. Okay. Because if you, if you look at the army, who's in the army now? Minorities are a big part of it. The blacks and the Latins are a big part of the army. And if you have problems here, the army might not support the dictatorship. So you could have 
a civil war here. Very easy. Okay, we got uh, Lily, then George, then Jan. Okay, Lily, then um, George, then Jan. Is it too soon to know what the effect of the right um, gaining power in France, what effect that's going to have on us and the rest of the world or in Europe? My question is, do you know what effect that might have? Oh, I, I think her name is Mary or Penn, and uh, she ran for president, and I think she got something like 15% of the vote. And uh, uh, the, the president now wants to have an election to get rid of that type of thing if he, he knows what's going on there. Because the right and people in France, like the United States, are not taught what Germany was during the Second World War and what it done to people. If you go to the, uh, the schools now, I doubt very much they're talking about the Second World War and Germany. So people forget and they vote against the thing they fought against during the Second World War. So uh, you have to keep reminding people in school what happened, but they don't teach them yet. That's the problem. Okay, then uh, George, George is next. George, go ahead. Well, I like Trump, but do, do you think Trump has studied Hitler? Because uh, Hitler was very popular in Germany in say 1939, very popular, and he declined, spiraled down after that. But uh, uh, I've heard that he's studying his uh, how he rose to power. Hitler, how Hitler rose to power. I'm going to raise it to Mussolini if you comment on Trump, Mussolini. On I was listening to uh, uh, Schwarzenegger, the bodybuilder, the weightlifter, and he was married to one of the Kennedys. And his father fought the Second World War. When he came back from the war, he was just uh, out of touch with reality. He was so screwed up from that war. And a lot of people in Germany has learned about it because it was taught in schools. So Germany is very cautious what's happening. They just try to have a coup in Germany what, about six months ago by the right, but didn't succeed. The same thing happened in Brazil. Bolsonaro, the president there, initially comes from Italy. His parents came from Italy, and they just hated him in Italy. Okay, we have. Uh, hi, and thanks for the talk. You talked about what was happening in Germany uh, before World War II and uh, discussed the fact that people were killing each other on the streets. Um, now, people who, are, people who are in their 70s, I've heard them say that what's happening in the Middle East is the worst thing that happened in their lifetime. But you and me, we remember something much worse that happened and it's called um, the Holocaust in World War II. And I would like you to comment, if you don't mind, about um, what effect you think that history is having on the uh, situation in the present. Wait for the mic, sir. Like I said, if you go to school, kid, uh, um, grammar school or high school, they don't teach your mother Second World War about the Germans and how they came to power. What they talk about is Hitler himself. But Hitler could not have come to power if he didn't have the backing of the industrialists and the bankers and the landowners. And that's how he came to power. 
Without that, they never could have come to power. So when they talk about Germany, they talk only about Hitler and who backed Hitler, they never talk about. Okay. I'll get to whip in one second. I just want to ask, um, you talked about how we went from a guild system to a system where serfs were forced to sell their labor. Could you walk us through it again, how that happened? Well, feudalism, like I said, uh, kept the guilds at a certain length. They weren't able to expand. They had limited freedom and they couldn't take over power as long as the feudal lords kept them in, in, in their place. But what happened was when they discovered America, they needed everything in America. And the only people that could build it were the guilds. So the guilds became so powerful that they took over power from, from the aristocracy. Thank you. Uh, so my question is uh, about uh, Russia and uh, the founding of the communist state uh, in 1917 uh, or 18, whatever. There's uh, a lot, much enthusiasm and support for that then radical idea. Um, and uh, by uh, 1940, uh, pretty much everyone was totally disappointed with the murderous spree and the poverty and everything else of the communist state. So my question is, um, you know, it was pretty much a failure. I think everybody can agree to that. And uh, um, why? Why? Why do you think it uh, it failed? The experiment of communism. Why did the experiment of communism fail? Actually, we had the World War Two, and that was over in 1945. And in 1945, they had to start from scratch because so much was destroyed in the Soviet Union. What they done in the Soviet Union is the same thing they done under the Tsar when the, when the Napoleon invaded. What they done. They didn't leave anything for Napoleon to eat. They didn't leave anything for Napoleon to stay. They, they just cleared out anything. So they didn't have any support in any way. And the lines from France to Russia were too long. So Napoleon was defeated. And what happened was, Stalin had the five-year plans, and they built up very fast uh, until the point where they had the Cold War, and they had to concentrate on armament. And instead of concentrating on making the lives better for the workers, they took that for granted and concentrated on supporting armament. And so they didn't have enough for the people to have, and the people got disenchanted. And that's what happened there. Okay, uh, Chris Cook, you got a question? Go ahead. Was that for me? Yes, Chris. Uh, so my question, after listening to what other people have been saying, how close do you think uh, the United States is to a dictatorship? Well, you, we'll find out in November. <laughs> I guess I could you explain this idea of counter revolution? Is, is there some intent by a person, a group, or, you know? arcs or something, um, you know, is there any way to have a real revolution in a good way? Um, all right. With that. <laughs> because the forces that are being destroyed is going to put up the fight. If it doesn't put up the fight, 
it will lose automatically. So after the revolution, what they do other things, they try to sabotage. And there's people in the government itself, they're counter-revolutionary, and they make off the revolutionary. So you got to pull up some people that will go the opposite way and try to overthrow the gov new government that comes into power. That's why you got dictatorship of the proletariat. Dictatorship of the proletariat means dictatorship of the workers, so there's no counter-revolution. Okay, at this point, I'm going to say let's get our, uh, let's go to rebuttals, and uh, I'd like to know who's got a rebuttal uh, ready to go, because if not online and in person, there's a lot of people wanting to go right away, and it's just sticking right there. What is it? Uh, they're, they're, go. Well, go ahead, Mike, and get up there. We'll give you each about five minutes or so. How many people in There's 17 right now, Mike. 16. Wow. Yeah, I know. Mike. Hey, everybody show up for my uh, transportation. All right, Mike, if you want to go rebut, rebut. You, you've got a chance to use the microphone and... Uh, don't forget my program on June 29th. You'll be very entertained on a communist, former communist country and infrastructure. All right. I um, I think that the only way we're going to go forward is free market and a democracy, a representative democracy. However, since America is so corrupt, and it seems like it's getting more and more corrupt every year, um, I hate to agree with Obama. However, when he trash-talked Roberts, when Robert said money was the same as speech, way back, what was that, 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. When Robert said money was free speech, that was a real bad idea. And now we're paying the consequences. Because That's speech true. comes from here and money comes from here. <laughs> and I think Robert is a lot to, you know, I hate to agree with Obama because he bailed out a lot of billionaires. Billionaires. Obama's re responsible for 15 trillion in debt. And then um, Bush and Cheney are responsible for 5 trillion for the oil wars. And Trump is responsible for 5 trillion in debt for his bailout of billionaires. So when you look at the debt, around 25 trillion, 30 trillion, I suppose, debt. A lot of it is these three presidents that bailed out. Uh, but Tim's one, I can talk. Uh, so I think that's a lot of the problems is just bailing out, getting the bigs bigger and the, the rich richer. And the haves had, had more. So um, anyway, I um the, the only way going forward is we got, I think, representative democracy and just really good regulations. When I look at European countries that seem successful, you know, first world countries, uh, they have representative democracy also, but they have a lot of regulations and people have free speech and they protest, and they protest hard. And uh, in this country, we're... Uh, where free speech is now, you know, the Constitution and free, and free speech is in peril after the uh, protest of the genocide in uh, Palestine. How much time have I got? Uh, About two or two or three more minutes. I'll, I'll uh, give the rest of my time to Sid. Okay. You're up, okay, sir. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. You're up. Get rid of the big. You're up. Go ahead. We'll get, take take us take about five six minutes. Well, since, since August 2022, Chicago has taken in over 41,000 illegal aliens and migrant asylum seekers. As more homeless people arrive from the southern border, existing Chicago residents are forced to. Compete, compete against the newly arriving homeless migrants for available housing, jobs, and other services. 
They're taking all this uh, these uh, 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 oh, yeah. housing. They're taking all this housing, and they're going to push us out of our homes. Uh, growing, growing demand is driving up rents, leading to more homelessness in Chicago. The city of Chicago has appropriated three hundred million for the migrants. Governor Pritzker and, and the state has allotted four hundred million more for them. Landlords have raised rents, pushing Chicagoans out to make housing available for migrants. The government is offering free government social services for the migrants for housing, health care, ch child care, college accessibility, family support, food assistance, public transportation, legal assistance, hate crime victim assistance, plus they get monetary payments. Uh, uh, Chicagoans, Americans don't get this. I mean, well, we, we get some, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, poor Chicagoans are not included in these programs. Americans pay taxes for migrants from another country. Most migrants don't qualify for asylum. They are coached to say they are fearful in their country and they are let in because the the, the uh, cartels tell them, say that you're feel fearful and that, that's the code word to let them in. Most just walk across the border. The Biden administration has sent 300,000 migrants to the U.S. on planes to, in, to be admitted to American cities like Portland, for example, they just fly them over there. And they don't even tell the people about you. You won't see them. The, the UN and progressives hate America. They would like to privatize this country. Many of the migrants are criminals, mental cases, and some are known terrorists. Now they are giving up giving some of the 10 to 20 million illegal aliens the right to vote so Democrats can steal another election and nullify citizens' votes. Trump is an imperfect candidate, but he will fight this Marxist claptrap. Yeah. He's telling the truth. Well, the thing is, guys, I, uh, although I like everybody giving their free views, I could not strongly more disagree with our other uh, person talking because I think immigration is what made this country great. We've had these same issues since the Irish came into Chicago. These same questions have been um, asked for the last 150 years. You know, it's uh, it's always kind of brought up when uh, the people in power are, are going to be uh, leaving power or taking themselves away. Now, I'm not I'm not upset about the thing is I know, but the problem with immigration is that it's broken. We need to bring more legal pathways in. We got to do a better vetting process. We got to secure the borders. Now, in the 1990s, there was a bipartisan bills running through Congress that would have solved all these troubles. And I, I don't remember what it was at this point. But the thing is, I think the whole thing about immigration has been it's it's been the nicest, most divisive, most convenient issue for politicians to run on because they can say they're a board or against it, and then they never do anything about it. Just recently, we had in Congress a bipartisan bill going through the Senate and the House that was worked on by a couple of senators. And then Trump comes along and says, don't support it. We need it to run on an election for. And that That's nothing correct. could be more hypocritical than that. Now, I'm not going to say that uh, Biden's been perfect because he hasn't been a perfect candidate. But as far as my, my concern is, the decency of the American presidency, the faith back that's been going into government, 
And the thing is, is that I think he's a lot more stable than Trump has ever been. Given the choice, I would rather support Joe, Joe Biden, though I do disagree with some of his policies. Trump did a good job of doing some deregulation, which probably was needed because the government does get a tense to be overreaching sometimes. And at the same time, though, you also have to get rid of old laws that are still in the books. There were some other things he did do. Now, I'm not agreeing with his tax cuts, but, you know, when you're talking about deficit reduction like the Republicans want, Trump added as much as any other person did. At least with Biden, you've got a couple of bills that have gone through the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Act that is going to make some big, profound changes in this country. And as far as I know, I... Been a, most of the time, most of my time, and over over the last since Ronald Reagan, I've been leaning Republican. I do support free markets. I do support free trade. I think that communism is a class, is a bunch of bunch of hooey because it doesn't work, and we can see that just by the outcomes of the countries. Those that profess communism have left their people in poverty. Those that have adopted a, the market capitalism principles. And I'm not saying uh, it's all completely free, but I'm talking about um, you know letting corporations and businesses go bankrupt and, and build. And the other thing that you got to realize is that a lot of a revolutionary change just isn't because of capitalism. There are two other factors that have built the United States up. One of them has been their extreme amount of research they put into universities and not taking patent claims on them and then letting companies get them because of that. And the second way has been um, basically file sharing and uh, free uh, free software and other things called the copyleft license. That has also contributed a lot to change in uh, the computer field. For example, many of you may not know what Linux is, but it's a free and open source software that's basically the file structure of most of your data centers in the world. There's also um, a lot of stuff that you can get free and open source. Yeah, you may have to learn a little bit about it, but that's the that's the point. You see, um, one of the things you've got to realize is that capitalism is based on trust. You trust that your that the dollar here is going to buy something, and the guy who gets that dollar gets something for it. And the dollar is nothing more, and money's nothing more than a medium of exchange. And that was very well illustrated in a good book in 1776 by Adam Smith, who basically laid out the basic philosophy of what a market was. He also talked about the divisions of labor. He also talked about, you know, the power of the corporation. And what he also said was something called the commons, which meant that there was to be taxes levied, government support of various functions and other things. And that model in a lot of ways, is basically work. Now, I'm not going to say that mankind is not perfect because we know he's not. Jesus Christ himself said that men are sinners, which means we've all rebelled and fallen short of the glory of God, and there, there is a propensity in all of us to become corrupt to a certain degree. What I like about the Christian religion and what I believe in is that it does give you a good moral code. It does give you a, a sense of conscience that you can help regulate that stuff. And I think what we're doing now is, uh, you notice in most communist countries, they forget about God. They forget about a creator. They forget about uh, things like morality. I've been watching recently some of the old broadcasts of Bishop Fulton Sheen on the internet. And some of them come from the 50s and the 60s, but if you guys would look at him, he is kind of prescient in a lot of his views. Talks about the youth in the 60s having no being rebellious, but not rebelling for something. He talks about the decline of American morality and pleasure seeking instead of, uh, you know, a good old fashioned work, work attitude and that like so. I also know, too, that the decline of the family, I mean, tra traditional family, like mother, father, and everything else has also led to our decline. I'm not going to condemn LGBTQ or gay people because they are here. They are human beings and they do need certain rights. What I don't like is when they're given specialized special privilege like a lot of others are. I also too have not been upset for uh, our black people, but they didn't really get integrated in society until they had 
full civil rights in the 60s. Traditionally, when immigrant groups come over here, they usually take about two generations to really uh, get assimilated into American culture, and they usually do. And uh, if they don't assimilate, they usually wind up leaving. Now, for example, in Europe right now, there's a lot of people not assimilating, and there's a lot of people who, the Muslims who flee uh, some of these certain countries, they want to rec recreate it in their new home country and don't want to learn <coughs> what the Western values are. Frankly, what I need, what, what I really think we need to do is look at our own selves first. Are we acting corrupt or are we acting honorably? Are we fostering the problem or are we helping to solve the problem? And a lot of that just means looking inside and saying to yourself, am I committing good or evil? Am I living up to the standards that I set for myself? I think religion and uh, God and uh, whether it be Jewish or some of the more pure forms of Muslims or even the Christians and some of the people on there should look at it and judge their own actions. You know, it's not the systems that are going to be the problems because we find corruption in the communist system. We find a lot of corruption in the capitalist system. It's just which one works better. I think that's going to be a capitalist system myself based on the fact that it does have some self-regulating principles in it. If you don't want a bakery and you don't like their food, you just go to another one and give them your money. You can vote for the goods and services you like. And if there is a monopoly, um, eventually they do go out of business because they, people will not buy from them after a while. And if they try to control things, there's usually such things as government, like the uh, like what happened under uh, Roosevelt when he was broke, broke up Standard Oil and some of the other trusts. We've seen this before. We've seen, if you look at your history between the 1890s and about 1920 or 1930, you're going to find a lot of parallelisms between then and now. So I'm going to, going to say this, person and woman, examine yourself and learn your history. Are we going to have another depression? Charlie, that's a question. That's a question. Okay. History repeats itself. All right. Margaret, Let's have to, I'm going to go. Ernie's capitalism wonderful. Okay. Margaret? Yes, gonna, just a second. <laughs> I'll what? have to. Un We'll get you next, Margaret, after uh, after Ernie, okay? No problem. Mine's right. simply a comment. All right, yeah. Uh, one quick thing to agree with uh, on Tim is that it's important to have regulation. We just had, had a short uh, or a fairly long illustration of what happens when regulation on time for rebuttals uh, is not properly controlled. <laughs> because the uh, because the regulator is is rebutting. Anyway, uh, I said a very a very very good uh, summary uh, of uh, recent economic history. Why I disagree with many of your conclusions and what should be done and how it should be done, but nonetheless, you gave us a good a good historical summary. Um, I believe, uh, as I think you do, we need a fair distribution of wealth. I think our distribution of wealth in this country is terrible. We're very good at creating wealth and, and creating innovation in this country better than any any society in past history. But uh, the distribution is is totally out of whack. I, I get sick to my stomach uh, when I hear about these salaries of athletes getting $200 million uh, salaries for a few years in new contracts. Totally insane. Totally insane the amount of wealth that a, that a few uh, very rich people have. Uh, and we have to do something about that. However, to set the facts straight, a lot of people have, have quoted this business about three people have as much wealth as everybody else. Uh, even Bernie Sanders, who, who I admire greatly and plan to vote for in November, um, uh, is he quoted that, and that is, that is not true because uh, it does not include all of the... Uh, uh, implied wealth that people have, even poor people have access to medical treatment and certain other government programs. I'm not even sure that Social Security benefits are included for the people that uh, 
uh, you know, are, are not in that rich three. So, it, but but the, the, the numbers are still way out of whack, even if they're not that far out of whack. Uh, the way I think and we should handle this, and I've said this before, is through taxation. I think we need a one-time net worth tax to try and kind of level things out a little bit. And then an annual net worth tax, as well as a progressive income tax. We would have to file a statement each year, not just of our income, which we do now, but also of our net worth. And, and that would be subject to some uh, progressive tax. And then we could get rid of regressive taxes, such as sales tax. Now we're getting rid of the regressive grocery tax here in Illinois, but there are still lots of others that we should get rid of. The only, the only transaction taxes we should have are those which are intended to control behavior, such as liquor taxes, smoking, gasoline, things like that. Those, those taxes could be uh, beneficial. Um, as far as socialism versus uh, uh, free market, uh, all countries in the world, currently and pretty much in the past as well, are amalgams of socialism and maybe even a little communism and, and free market. Some of them have emphasized very hardly, highly one system or the other, such as China very much toward the collectivist, and Russia was quite toward the collectivist, but not 100%. Uh, and today, uh, we are partially socialist, I, I think take great joy in pointing that out to some of my right-wing wing friends that, that we're a socialist country in part. But uh, my belief is that we need to be more socialist, more like the European countries, who are, for, for the most part, including the Scandinavian countries, free market countries, where there's some freedom uh, of enterprise, uh, but, but more things are through uh, governmental entities, which means a, a more even distribution of wealth and having people's needs met without without uh, attempting to to shoot down uh, the, the profits and the and the incentives that our system has for people to create new enterprises and create new products and to do a better job in delivering those products and services. This is what made us very, very, very prosperous. Um, is it an economic system? What is the difference between Marxism and authoritarianism and dictatorship? Marxism is an economic system. Authoritarianism and dictatorship are political systems. Uh, history shows one of the reasons I certainly favor uh, a large, in large part, our free, uh, our free uh, uh, enterprise system uh, but I think we need to tax more. I think we need to even the wealth out with taxes. But history shows that communism and even socialism does not do well. Okay, the countries that have it uh, generally are not as prosperous and the standards of living are not as high as in countries that have a market system of one sort or another. I think our problem lies in our political system, not in our economic system, and in our democracy. The way our democracy is set up, it is, it is uh, a system, it's a market democracy. The first are the people who are the best at marketing themselves and their ideas, and thereby get the most votes, are the people who control. Not necessarily the people that have the best ideas or the most, uh, have the most integrity and are the hardest working and so forth in government. It's, it's whoever can sell it, and and it often is sold to people who have something to gain. Either wealthy people or corporations, they want certain things uh, to help them, and they will put their money where their mouth is, and, and they often get what they want, which is not necessarily best for the country as a whole. Uh, and, and as far as the, uh, the two-party system, um, it tends to lead more to fights, not to solutions. A good example of that uh, is this recent immigration bill, which the Republicans came up with, and then they, they decided not to vote for it because they'd rather have a fight. They want to have an issue at campaign time. So we have no immigration bill, even though there was a good one, or a better one anyway than what we've got now. It was, uh, was up uh, before Congress. Um, and that, that kind of covers most of the issues. I, 
you know, we can talk about this for hours and hours, and we probably will, but that's enough for now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor. Margaret, wait, you're next, and then we'll let our... Uh... All right, Margaret, you're next, and we'll go well, after her. These were just questions to ask the, one of the previous speakers to clarify. Are we saying that people who are asylum seekers, immigrants, refugees, are not people of human dignity? I mean, where is the term illegal alien coming from, number one? Number two, where are your statistics that talk about the fact that people who come into this country uh, who are not yet U.S. citizens can vote? And thirdly, where are your statistics that would indicate that these people coming into our country are rapists, murderers, et cetera? Just trying to clarify and get more information from you, sir. Well, I, um, yeah. not to suggest that you're out of order, but I would suggest that Margaret and George schedule some kind of debate in the future about immigration so we can get to this in more detail. I think that would be an excellent idea, Margaret. <laughs> I'm not an authority on it. I'm just curious as to his statistics oh, and facts. It would make for an interesting... <laughs> All George, right. George didn't hear your question. He's not really right, but it's, bring it up uh, sometime in the future. Yeah, we would like to see it. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, your, your rebuttal's next, and uh, take your take your five minutes or whatever you need. And uh, sure. So, uh, Margaret, I just want to say first off, if you could share your email in the chat, uh, I think you and I should talk to Tom O'Donnell because you had a comment a few weeks ago. I think it's about infrastructure or something, and I definitely want to, you know, want to make you understand your concerns are valid, and, uh, and we should solve all these problems, not gloss over them. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone that there's more than two people running for president. Um, the great thing about uniting free markets and democracy, which is what we're trying to do in America, is that this country is a land of opportunity. We're supposed to have lots of choices, and that means in the voting booth and on the shelf. So uh, Trump, the choice uh -huh. between Trump and Biden, and RFK, they're, they're trying to make us choose between these people in a false dichotomy. They're setting up uh, false opposites and... We need to just resolve to vote for people who have never been accused of genocide or rape or child abuse. And right there, that knocks out the top three people in the running. So there's running, they're called minor party candidates. Uh, to address what Charlie said, um, Nikita Khrushchev said, we will bury you, but some people say it's a mistranslation. He said uh, something like, we will dig your, we will dig you up or something. Uh, and Khrushchev clarified this later. He, he didn't mean to threaten a communist invasion. What he was saying was that the American working class would bury the people, because um, basically implying the worker, workers of America would overthrow capitalism eventually. Uh, to address what Tim said, uh, I don't agree with the statement that Stalin killed 60 million people. For, for one, there weren't 60 million people who died in the Soviet Union between 1924 and 1953. If you want to add up all the people killed by all the communist regimes in the entire world over the last hundred years, maybe that adds up to 60 million, maybe even more. I'll grant you that. Uh, but we should remember so Stalin signed the death warrants of 830,000 people. I'm not saying it's good, I'm just saying it's true. And people say that, oh, Stalin killed people in the holodome or famine. It's like, no. He inherited a famine. There was already a famine. Uh, Stalin collectivized farms in order to try to address the problem with the famine. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't mean to, I don't mean to support, to, to promote Stalin here. And Sid was absolutely right. The party had too much, especially over the workers, and they prioritized uh, preparing for the war that Lenin and Stalin knew would eventually come from Germany. And uh, they took grain away from people and they, caused some starvation while solving some of it. So they implemented a solution that actually just caused more problems. So of course there are problems, but uh, you have to remember we should be grateful for 8 million of the people that Stalin did kill because those people were Nazis and they needed to be killed. Um, I'm glad that Tim brought up the commons and the internet because uh, this helps uh, remind us something I talked about in my Taft Harley lecture. There's more than sectors of the economy. We're used to having this false dichotomy, like I'm saying, Trump versus Biden, capitalism versus communism. It's all fake choices. There's not just the public and the private. There's the pure public sector. There's the commons, which is like, I mean, common farms and uh, nature. Um, there's private sector. There's companies whose property claims are defended and protected by the state. And there's clubs and private clubs and individual run businesses. There's people who protect their own property claims. And so this is why I'm not a libertarian anymore, because they say 
uh, oh, the state should protect people's property claims. They, they say the state shouldn't do anything, but they do believe in the use of violence to protect people's property claims. Property claims need to be open to competition or else you don't have capitalism. And, uh, and John Lee, I think, pointed out, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, you're right that socialism and capitalism and all these terms, they're uh, poorly defined and it's confusing and we need to be more specific about it. There's dozens of types of both socialism and capitalism. Many of them haven't been tried yet. And uh, Carrie brought this up in the chat, um, uniting socialism or capitalism or having a mix. Uh, if you're interested in having a mix, uh, look up systems called mutualism and Georgism. And Joseph Tito in, Yo in Yugoslavia uh, I don't know what the name of the system was. I don't know what to call it, but it was to neither be communist nor capitalist, to try to be on friendly terms with both and be neutral. And there's a, there's a neutral caucus in the UN. It's, it's called the non-aligned movement, the NAM. And their idea was to have uh, most businesses be collectively owned, but still have a market structure so that those collective businesses can trade with each other. That's neither full capitalism nor full communism. So there is a compromise that we can make and we can have it without markets or with markets, without money or with money. Um, and this is going to be unpopular, what I'm about to say, but I just want to say, uh, Mike, um, if you support free speech, you should consider supporting Citizens United because uh, it's not that money is free speech, it's that money is part of our right to give give freely, which is part of our self-expression, and that's part of our right to free speech. And the, this, okay, we can talk about that. Um, one of the things that Citizens United, um, so the McCain-Feingold Act put limits on campaign donations, and that was struck down by Citizens United, but that's partially good, not to say the whole Citizens United perfect or anything, I know it's very unpopular, but another thing the McCain-Feingold Act did was it limited our speech in the month before an election. Um, people couldn't make documentary films to be aired about a particular candidate within 60 days of the election. And that interrupts our ability, that interferes with our ability to find out about October surprises. And the last two elections, the information that came out about John Podesta and Hillary Clinton, and then later Hunter Biden, that totally swung the election and changed what people think. And if we had had the McCain-Feingold Act in place, we wouldn't be able to hear information in the two months before an election that might influence our decision. And I think we shouldn't give Congress the freedom to limit our free speech. That, that's ridiculous. Thanks. Any more rebuttals? Yeah. All right, go ahead. Uh, El uh, Ellen, you want to go up and uh, make your rebuttal? Go ahead. Okay, Charlie, you'll go right after Ellen. All right, you'll go after Ellen, Charlie, and then we'll get Andy, I think, after that. Yes, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Ellen Corley, and uh, I love this free speech forum. Thank you for doing it. Uh, you know, it's so important for us, and um, thank you, Sid, for, for giving your talk. Uh, I, I look at free speech, uh, forums kind of like you know the, like society itself like the ideal model classroom John Dewey progressive democratic classroom idea that where I learned you know you use the dialectic method to to examine issues problems uh, be able to find a synthesis between your thesis and your antithesis and um, you know, it's, this is what, uh, you know, I think ideally what I'd like to see is more openness. Uh, I think, you know, like a classroom, if Charlie uh, picks the topics, you know, eight, 10 weeks in advance, that makes it difficult. I, I do, you know, um, I think uh, Jim Fix, Spencer, a really brilliant guy that, that I've, we've had here twice, uh, you know, he's a philosopher, I guess they call him a conspiracy theorist, but, um, you know, he's a model of, I, I think, you, you know, he, he looks at what, you know, what is the uh, vaccine? What is, who killed John F. Kennedy? You know, um, what, what happened to Kennedy? You know, 
he, uh, you know, I think that is the essence of what we need to be is investigators, citizen investigative journalists, right? Look at what, you know, what is causing this? Uh, I know I, when I studied philosophy of education was my favorite course in my graduate studies. And it, you know, they just asked to think about what is science? But, and it, it's really, you know, how we need to be taught the critical theory, you know, the critical, look at these social issues and um, analyze them. I, when I left teaching, uh, I was trying to teach mass media. This is in the mid 80s. And um, they were requiring that for ninth graders. And I, I put on uh, this um you know, War of the Worlds cassette, thinking that'll get through radio and the curriculum on that. And um, I couldn't understand it. That was the one day they observed me. I, you know, I didn't have all my my instructional, you know, plan working to a T. I just sat down and went. But, and that that's um, sad that that's the way teaching, you know, they, last time I applied for a teaching job, just last year at a, Noble School for Martin Luther King. I'd do it. They didn't, before I even got home, they had said, thanks, no thanks. So, you know, this is really everything I know about philosophy is seeing, you know, the problems, the kind of fascist constraints on democracy and all of us. Uh, it's, you know, we are really, I think we are in the fourth right. There's, uh, you know, they say that the Cold War was the Third Reich or the Third World War, and um, and now the we're in this Fourth Reich. But it they're getting away with it because it's an invisible empire, you know. And that that was the greatest gift that the empire gave itself. That they uh, actually Carl Schmidt. I gave a talk on it here. Uh, tried to um, he has the book Political Theology. Um, you know, the strategy of tension. He came up with the Hitler's idea of, you know, burn down the Reichstag and say that the communists did it. And then he said, now we suspend all our rights and we, we declare a war on a war on communism, which is like a war on terrorism. Now, you know, we have, it is a war of terrorism, it's a war on terrorism. And, um, you know, if they call me anti-Semitic, actually threw me off the ballot. I realized I was an early, you know, early victim of this scam, um, you know, that because, you know, that's, you criticize Israel or this uh, invisible totalitarian infiltration of our democracy and takeover, it's really an invisible coup d'etat with no, no accountability, uh, no because they just keep denying it. This this was called lawfare. It's, you know, everything is really a weapon, a counter-revolutionary weapon against the mind, you know, our minds, our hearts and souls and minds. They, um, it, it's, uh, it really is, it's called psychological warfare, psyops, you know, um, the media, TV, everything is just, you know, uh, you know, my father, he's like, you know, we need Trump, you know, and they, they, they this red map system, you know, this, I, I, everybody in my family is in the advertising industry. You know, I was a market research analyst, my sister's account executive, my brother's a copywriter, you know, my father's in sales, you know, and what we have now, uh, luckily before that, I, I had a master's in education and you know, we really have to think of ourselves as teachers and students and mutual self -learn helpers, learners, um, because the, the, you know, the commerce model, the commercial model of everything's propaganda is, um, that's what we got there. Uh, and they could just sell us poison and um, which they're doing, mandating we take the poison and pay twice as much for it and um you know i i was i know my time's almost up but i i was telling a, a girl at a meeting this a bill and dr bob a play about aa and they um the truth is that 
AA split off from fascism because uh, ideally Buckman, Frank Buckman was the fascist that, that initially, uh, you know, got sober and inspired Bill Wilson to get sober. But and he went directly into the Center for Moral Rearmament, directly into fascism. And AA said, we are not aligned with any sect, denomination, organization, institution. We neither endorse or um, oppose any causes. And, you know, that's how they remain, you know, between two or three people, there, there's God in the middle of you. You know, it, we've got to keep it that simple. And I think that's what I like about Marx and liberation theology and progressive education. It's subjective. It's people-centered as opposed to what my stepfather, the Ayn Rand uh, disciple taught me with was brainwashed with, which is objectivism. And we are objects in are like bugs in their jar. And um, he couldn't see it. You've got to have the left brain and the right brain. You've got to have the subjective. You've got to be able to, uh, Bob Lichtenberger says, make meaning and, but also question authority say what they don't want us to say. I don't know how we're going to get a decent person elected, but I, I think we need to all run. That's all I got. Thanks. All right, Charlie, you. you're next. Okay, Charlie, you're next, and then we'll get you or Andy. Okay, Andy, and then we'll get you, okay? Charlie, you're next. Go ahead, unmute. Unmute, Charlie. Charlie, unmute. If you're gonna rebut, unmute Charlie. Charlie, you gotta unmute. There we go. All yeah. right, first of all, I'd like to thank Sid for a very nice uh, topic covered a lot of areas. I will be brief as usual. Uh, I will cover five areas uh, because I organize my rebuttals. Uh, number one. I heard it there, oh, it was a good thing we got rid of regulations. The government got rid of regulations. That is not a universally accepted principle. Why are there regulations? Why does the government create regulations? Is it because federal employees such as myself have nothing to do? And said, well, let's write some regulations today. No, the Congress, the legislative bodies come together and usually there's criminal activities. These are called cheaters. And they codify laws so that there's not a repetition of criminal activity. They pass a law and it's given greater definition in the form of a regulation. There's law, rule, and regulation. It's a sequential thing. So to say, well, we got rid of regulations is a little bit about saying like, well, we're now allowing theft. It makes absolutely no sense. Now, if you're gonna talk at the college, I wanna hear some real seasoned things. But oh boy, we got rid of regulations, meaning you in essence, you are permitting crime, crime to take place. Makes no sense to me, but it does to some of you. Number two, I heard a thing that about Communism is a dictatorship and an oligarchy. Here there, Chris. What happened was communism took hold in Russia. Russia has its own culture. The KBG and the oppressiveness were czarist inventions. One of the things, and plus on top of it, another thing happened. First year in a country that has no tradition of human rights. And number two, I mean, it was really oppressed in Russia. Unbelievable. And number two, who won the revolution? The Bolsheviks. There's another group that has no, just no, no fondness of human rights whatsoever. So you're in a country with no, no history of human rights, and the guys taking over are bad guys. So it doesn't mean that communism or socialism by any means, is oppressive. You have to look at what country it happens in. In England, there was no oppression. 
in other countries around the world, including the United States, Germany, whatever. All right, that's the second one. Uh, third one is, all oh, the thing about immigrants, within a generation or two, the immigrants get assimilated more so quicker than ever, and they start paying back whatever little assistance we gave them to get settled. And they pay back 10 times more by joining the economy and becoming productive citizens. So it's a living of it as a loan. It's not a gift. So what I'd say, put that to bed. Number And the fourth thing is, I've also heard again, like Ernie, that, and Tim in particular says this all the time, that capitalism produces more goods and results in a higher standard of living, which is true than communism. Capitalists are very good at producing goods cheaply. But who does this production? Children? People working like slaves in some factories? These factories in Asia? And say, oh, whoa, well, this, this is a measure how it works. It's only a measure. It is actually a, a, a measure of how oppressive a system can be. It produces more goods than communism. That doesn't mean it's better. It means it's worse. Someone is paying the price for producing these goods cheaply. Someone is, again, there is a cheater operating there. That's all you're saying. You're, oh, you're saying more cheating is better. All right. And the, um, let's see. Um, oh, and the last thing is, we hear a lot about conspiracy theories. We just heard some here tonight. Conspiracy theories aren't bad the first or second time you hear them. But let's, come on now. Over and over and over again, these become obsessions with some people. And they stay up all night trying to establish the truth or validity of particular theories. And the fact of the matter is, I was thinking the other day, I've yet to hear, I've heard a lot of all the conspiracy theories over and over and over at the college, but never once have any of these ever been proven true? How come? You just keep up and repeating them, and you never have been proven one. Show me one conspiracy theory that has ever been established as true. This guy did this, and this guy did that, and this happened, and that happened, and there's a zillion, a zillion of these, but never one of these propositions ever established as true. That's just it. So please, if we've heard your conspiracy theory once or twice at at the college, may give it a rest. People claim there's an update on it, and there's nothing new coming out about a lot of these. They, they get settled in and so forth. But I've yet to hear one. I mean, I like them. They're kind of interesting. Another analysis another explanation of what took place. But sooner or later, you've got to establish the validity of your, your preposition. That's it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Sid. Oh, come again when you got a chance. Thank you. All right. Andy Anderson, you're next. Go ahead. Uh, the first thing I would say, I would ask Charlie to print out a list of conspiracy theories he thinks are talked about too much at the college that have never been proven. You so, got your own list. I <laughs> Use your own list. Charlie, you had Charlie, Charlie you know, all the time. they're all good. <laughs> I just say that? He has all the lists of them. Charlie, we got. We. I wish you that. Let Andy have his time. We had yours without interruptions. Yes, a question. Charlie, uh, Charlie, uh, uh, there's a great. Um, I've probably read 20 articles from different sources in the last month that say if you tell the truth in America on something, if you tell the God's awful truth that the billionaires don't want us to know about, then they they tag you as a conspiracy nut. Telling the truth in America on several different subjects, Charlie will start screaming into the mic, that's a conspiracy. 
That's a conspiracy. You have no proof. Okay. When Charlie is standing in a blizzard of evidence claiming he can't see a single snowflake. Snowboard. Snowflake. Okay. And, and that's, what, that's what we've got in America. People are standing in a blizzard and maintaining, I don't see anything. I, I, have, I, I can't see any evidence at all. And everybody see this thing I printed? It's a slogan means silence means consent. It comes down, uh, it was spelled out real, really well in the movie, A Man for All Seasons, about Sir Thomas More. He said, the English law means silence means consent. If I'm silent about the king's new oath that he wants to get a divorce, you must construe that I agree to it, not that I deny it. Well, si if you're silent about something, it means it's all, you're okay with it. And Americans have been way silent about a lot of things for a long time, and it's creeping up on us to November 5th. Right now, a couple of quick points. People don't realize the analysis shows over the last 60 years, when a Republican administration is in office, the suicide rate goes up. <clears throat> the, 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 uh, the, the, the the standard of living of people goes down. When when Democrats get in office, they begin to reduce the deficit, not not increase it. Republicans that always shovel money to rich people, that's their job, is to get in office, take power, and shovel as much money to rich billionaire benefactors as they can before they get thrown out. Number two, on Common, Dream, common Dreams Today, the Common Dreams website, there's an article that said the G7 countries, the top, that's Canada, Japan, America, UK, the seven G7 countries spend 62 times as much on military stuff as they do on humanitarian aid. Martin Luther King said it best, any society that spends more on the machinery of death than on helping people live better is headed toward spiritual death. So, I want to give you a little demonstration. You probably haven't seen a visual aid like this in a long time. This is where we are today that people are ignoring. Here's a, here's a set of, uh, these are like uh, tongs. You, you, you pick stuff up like this if it's something you can't pick up with a spoon, right? Everybody see that? There's some, uh, yeah. So there, there's a place in the country basically that the leaders are telling, telling kids, uh, here, here's some utensils in a bucket. Go, go out there and see if you can scoop up the remains of your sister or your mother after a bomb splatter them all over everywhere. That's what's going on in Gaza. Mm -hmm. There, people aren't just being killed; they're being obliterated. And it's been done with American bombs and American dollars. And if you're okay with telling a kid, here, here's a bucket and a spoon, go out there and pick up the remains of your mom or your dad. If you're okay with that and stay silent about it, then it means we reproach spiritual death also. And also, how do you create terrorists? Do you think some of those kids aren't going to remember that it was American bombs that obliterated their family? They're not going to all be peaceful like what Martin Luther King and Gandhi talked about. When they get to be adults, or maybe some of them are adults now, they'll come here and disable our electric grid, which is one of the soft targets. We, we lose electricity, and we have several million dead before you can turn around in a few weeks. Without, what does it mean without electricity? No sewage, no water, no food delivery, no refrigeration. Back to the Stone Age, Americans aren't prepared for that. There, there's places all over the world, they live without electricity. They know how to survive. We don't. And we're creating what's called, in 1985, there was a report on the subject of decapitation. It was made for Representative Jack Brooks in Texas. They were burning all copies. Didn't want anybody to see it. Two-year study for Congress about how fast the United States, the head of government, could be decapitated with one suitcase new brought into Washington in a backpack. We're talking about a 12-bomb war here. 
All this talk about more planes and missiles and bombers, it's all obsolete. If you want to know what, uh, everybody talks about the hazards of Intel and AI. Go to the library and get the movie War Games and watch it. Or get the movie Dr. Strangelove. Watch those two games, those two movies, and it will give you the insanity of the military industrial mind in this country. Okay. And right now, Donald Trump is being backed by big mega churches that keep their flock. Nuclear war is God's plan for America. We don't, that's why they say there's no such thing as global warming and climate change. We don't have to worry about that because if the plants go in hell in a handbasket, that's okay. Bible prophecy. We'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns, but this one has to be destroyed first. If you're okay with that, then just stay silent about it. But if you think that's insane, we got to speak up everywhere between now and November, or our country is gone. Period. Okay, we have two more rebutters. Um, if you're ready, I'll, I'll get you. Chris, you'll be our last rebutter. Final remarks. All right, we got one more rebutter here. Then you go, Chris, and I'll have Sid make his final re remarks. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Sid, thanks for your talk. It was good. So, um, somebody said something about America being afraid of third parties. America, USA is afraid of third parties. But Cornell West is running for president. So maybe I'll vote for Cornell West. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay. Dr. Uh, nobody probably heard of God, Dr. Gabor Mate. Yeah. He's a psychiatrist. He's talking about uh, Gaza and uh, he had his 80th birthday a few days ago. And they had Palestinian food. So he talks about children uh, trauma, mm -hmm. children who have, get trauma, and it affects their whole life. And they they can't cope in society. They can't deal with other people. They become maniacs and killers and psychotic terrorists, or they become politicians in Washington and run wars in Gaza and Ukraine with no thinking of other people. And it's all because of being abused as a child. And that's the way Congress is, and I think the president and people running for office in the Democratic and Republican Party. Now, as far as monopolies go, the Exxon Mobil is a monopoly. And so why don't we break it up? I think it's every hundred years, you gotta break up the corporation. And as far as unions go, Starbucks and Amazon have unions. And uh, what's his name? Uh, Bezos and uh, Howard. Or whatever his name is at, at Starbucks, they're so afraid of they're so afraid of unions. They hire lawyers to come in and preach to the employees, tell them, "Oh, unions are bad. Unions are bad." But the but the workers they don't don't listen to those lawyers, and they make a union anyways. So that's all I got to say. All right, Chris, Chris Cruz, you're the last rebutter. And then we're going to have Sid make his final remarks. Sounds good. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. So uh, mine will be brief. Okay. Uh, so first I want uh, you to know that to, uh, for this particular election, uh, I'm uh, looking at all sides as a independent. And so the advantage of that is to see the good and the best on all parties that are um, interested in voting. And as a precinct chair, I tell the folks in my precinct uh, here in Austin, Texas, in the state capital um, here in Travis County. And, um, 
And what I tell folks when I knock on their doors to um, about voting is to remember something very simple. And that is your vote is your voice. Use it and encourage other people to use their voice because this is the difference between whether you will have a democracy or you will not. And so do this for the children. You don't have to do this for yourself. If you can't find a reason to vote, then use it to vote for the future of the children of our planet. I wanna remind everybody something, uh, and that is um, one of the things that I learned in, um, and in the United States Air Force is the um, change of pilot. And what I wanted to point out, what you see about when you get off this, off the surface of this planet, you see something that is just incredible uh, because it is a incredible place that we live. And, they, and we are here to preserve it, not to destroy it and not to destroy ourselves in that process. I will tell you the honest thing, the closest thing to this planet is 4.3, approximately 4.3 light years away. That is the closest thing. You know what that is in miles? It's 25 trillion miles away. And there's not another, There's that's, a, that's just a star next to us, not anything else that we can actually get to. We have a choice, make the right choice for the right things for the planet, to give the children a future. And that is my epitaph for the evening. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. final remarks. Stay right where you're at. Just go ahead. And, uh, go ahead. During feudalism, people said you can't overthrow feudalism. <laughs> These people, the, the uh, the, the, the king has royal blood, and it's ordained from God that he should rule, and we can't do anything about it. And they always say that about the present system. This is the best system in the world, but eventually people get rid of it because it's not the better system in the world. Thank you, sir. All right. That's it for tonight's College of Complexes. I wish you all a good night. And we're going to stop the recording at this point. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, if you want to converse amongst yourselves, I can uh, transfer the uh, host controls to Charlie if he wants them. But if not, we'll just sign off now. All right. So I guess we're all good to go.